Yo, yo, yo. Hey, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over. That's what this is all about. My name is Kurt Barron. I'm your host. And today I've got two good friends on, Dr. John Cranham and Lee Culp, who's a fantastic technician. And they asked the question, is the Stone Age of Dentistry dead? Where we examine AI, robotics, the future of digital dentistry, and how to apply it in your practice. What an amazing show and insight on what the future looks like in dentistry. So check it out. Hope you enjoy it, and we'll see you soon. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over. And you know, I got one thing in, I got one thing on my mind here. It's like, if you're showing up, I want to make your life and your practice a little bit better. That's what this show is all about. And I got two friends of mine on today, and I guarantee you, you're going to think better and you're going to do better in your practice. And we're going to address a lot of these issues that you might have in your brain about, you know, is the Stone Age of dentistry dead? I don't know. Let's ask the experts. So I got my good friend, Dr. John Cranham and Lee Culp on today as we examine these issues. Guys, thanks for being on. Really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. We're excited Happy to be here. Yeah. I'm, I'm pumped. Now, if you're a longtime listener, first time caller, I don't say that a lot, but I don't even know what that means. So, you know, you already know Dr. Cranham and, and you know, Lee, you have been a friend of the communities that we've all been hanging around with. I swear I've drank beer with you at least once or twice. Um, twice. Maybe twice, you know, um, but uh, I want you guys to both, uh, you know, we've got a lot of dental students listening now and younger dentists. Um, right. If somebody doesn't know who you guys are, let's start there. I want to know your stories and who you guys are. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Lee. Uh, okay. My name is Lee Culp. I am a dental technician. I've been a dental technician for over 35 years. So way back in the day, my specialty was metal ceramics and making really nice natural ceramics. We moved from there into all ceramics. I was one of the developers of Empress and then Empress Aesthetic, and then came digital. So I went to actually went to Serona and asked them, um, how do we get involved as laboratories? And I've been digital for over 20 years and own a laboratory and surgical design center here in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's awesome. 20 years digital? Since day one. We were the first digital lab on the planet. I think I've had an email address for like 17. So you've got me beat. <laughs> hey, speaking of email addresses, you got to get rid of Kratom's AOL. Can you do that? <laughs> I swear to God, I give him crap about that every day. Hey, does it still say you've got mail when it comes no, in? No, 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 it doesn't. No, no. Okay. You know, I love to razz you. So John, tell us, a, tell your story a little bit. Yeah. So finished dental school in 88, uh, heard Pete Dawson for the first time in 89 and um, got a, got turned on by that. Did the Panky Institute and Spear and Coyce and all those guys early on. And um, I think what got me going was uh, I may have been one of the first to li be listening to both the occlusion people and the cosmetic people. And I created a lecture called the Cosmetic Occlusal Connection, which is crazy now, but it was diametrically opposed ideas at the time. And I think that's about the time I met you, Kurt. Yeah. And it got me going. Uh, I served, um, got the chance to join the academy and their faculty in 04 and became the active acting clinical director in 2007 and held that position till 2020. And, uh, and what really has got me fired up now is, um, and really one of the reasons I stepped away from the academy was I, I was really wanting to take my practice in a direction uh, that Lee took his lab and, and go 100% digital. And I was struggling with the fact that, that all these workflows that I was doing, it was going to just be hard to uh, change the academy to get all the faculty aboard and all that stuff. And I, and I really wanted to teach it. So 
Uh, plus, my daughter joined me, so she was in the, mm -hmm. the practice. So I wanted to be, you know, there with her a little bit more. But uh, Lee and I have have created a, a, a business called Cranham Culp Digital Dental, which is really 100% um, focused on helping uh, the global dental community uh, transition to fully uh, digital workflows and, and, and technologies. And so it's really been fun. I mean, coaching small group of doctors now and starting to get out there and, and building curriculum and all that stuff. Yeah, I love it. So you guys have been listening. You know John's been a big influence in my life. And if you know anything about John, he likes to live on the edge. When you created the Cosmetic Occlusal Connection, we thought you were taking the express train to you know where, you know, like, uh, but it was really like it came right at the right time. Your timing was impeccable on that. And I actually flew up to Traverse City, Michigan to watch it myself because I wanted to, you know, I, I was thinking you were going to get tarred and feathered and you weren't. You people, people embrace both sides of it. So I have no doubt you're going to be pushing the envelope here of what we already know and what we believe. And this is a great topic because you can't go anywhere now without hearing digital dentistry. And let's let's start with the foundation, okay? You guys have both been on this journey. You've seen the evolution. You've seen it, you know, fully analog now to fully, where are we at at this point in time in 2022? Give us a little historical perspective. Well, if we look back, digital, I mean, digital's been around for quite a while. I remember going to the Hinman meeting in the 70s and seeing a lecture from Francois Dure starting to talk about digital. So it, it amazed me at the time. And yeah, I was just looking for it to happen. And when I saw it with CEREC, I was the technician who went to CEREC and go, hey, this would be cool in the laboratory. And we started there. So we've gone from making things. So initially, it was really just to make something. We would design something and make something. And that's the CAD CAM part of it. But when we look at digital dentistry, and this is where it's so important. So digital dentistry is more about communication than anything else. Making things actually becomes secondary to the communication we have as a dental team, whether it's a restorative dentist, periodontist, orthodontist, oral surgeon, laboratory, whatever, we build virtual patients and diagnose and treatment plan and restore if necessary those patients that we've created digitally as a team on a computer at the same time while we're all looking for at the same patient. That's never been done in the history of dentistry. And that's really what we can do today. So we can virtually do anything you can conceive. Yeah, I really like what you just said. Like I wrote that down. That is a huge nugget right there because I've, I listen to a lot of stuff lately. I've never heard anybody describe it as Communication first, communication. make things second. That is a great point, you know. And John, you get to see it, the evolution of this. Now, let's speak to the truth of it. Digital is sexy. It is. It's very sexy. I think so, so, yeah. Yeah. So what are the pitfalls if I'm a young dentist? Let's say I'm 30 and I'm listening to this. Like, Well, I, I, and again, I'm going to take one little different angle before we go to the pitfalls. I think the other big thing in the dental practice um, is just efficiency. I mean, because yeah. Lee is talking a lot about the major things, but for me to, um, in, in an analog world, for me to look at an occlusal problem, I was taking impressions, I was taking a face bow, I was taking a wax bite, it had to be poured, it had to be mounted. I mean, it was a couple days mm -hmm. before I could look at models on an articulator. Sure. Now, we basically do an exam, we scan, we take a, a centric scan bite, if you will, and they go up to the cloud and my assistants will start taking pictures and my son has those digital digital scans mounted on a virtual articulator before they're done taking pictures. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can look at it in five minutes. And, and so the other thing that goes is all of the inaccuracies that we really lived with with stone expansion and contraction and blebs on models and all the things that happened that prevented us from getting really consistent and precise results so you know me i like that acronym pep which is predictability efficiency and profitability and predictability and efficiency in a dental practice goes through the ceiling in terms of just the nuts and bolts now how you decide to work with that data. You know, we have doctors mm -hmm. that are like to do their own wax ups. We have doctors that refer to the lab. I mean, 
But there isn't any question that, you know, if people are wondering whether this is like a fad or if this is here to stay, it isn't a fad. The ship right. has sailed. I mean, mm-hmm. the stone is going away and and these are things that, that are uh, they're there. Now, pitfalls, I, I mean, one of the things I think challenges doctors that look at it is they tend to look at the technologies like a scanner and they look at the CBCT and they look at, um, you know, maybe T-scan or, or or, you know, a variety of different things. But what they lack often is the a way to um, bring all these technologies together to be able to evaluate data and to be able to treatment plan and to then make things like wax ups and provisionals and, you know, splints and all these things. And so that's where I think the next real evolution is, is getting software in the practice that allows you, let, allows the team to as Lee would say, either be doing things completely in-house or share with an orthodontist or a surgeon and communicate in a way that that if you pull something up and, and share a virtual instrument through TeamViewer, it's like you're, they can be 100,000 miles away and still be like you're sitting right next to each other. That's the other thing about training with it yeah. is that you know coaching a doctor utilizing this technology is so powerful because... Yeah. Um, you know, we used to try to do it with analog articulators and they'd hold the articulator up to the little camera. And I, I couldn't see anything. Yeah. But we can see, we can see and share in a way that's just another level. Yeah. Let me piggyback on that. Cause Lee, you'll love this. When I was 23, I got to work in a dental lab. Wasn't like, All right. uh, you know, and so these, these triple trays and the trays would come back and you'd hear somebody scream. I'm like, what's the screaming about? <laughs> and they would be looking at the impression And they would go, you want me to make teeth with these? And, you know, (laughs) you've heard all this before. You know what I mean? So, yeah, garbage in, garbage out. And then they'd argue, it's not garbage in, it's garbage in, garbage. It's not garbage in, garbage out. It's garbage in, garbage stays. You know, hear all this stuff, you know? So you could see the complications um, from that. And when we're talking about the Stone Age and the predictability, like, John, you, we, we get visceral reactions when you talk about predictability because really what you're doing is your streamlining process is you're making them incredibly accurate um, from front to back. And then there was the joke a couple of years ago that some of these lab technicians were pushing their best restorative docs to get on digital or even purchasing the machines with them because sure. they could get the same product going the other way. Is that how the relationships kind of developed? Do you push John or does he push you? Like, Or is we it a little bit you. of both? We, we, he's we take turns. Been, he's been the pusher. <laughs> I think he's been the pusher, but I think in the seminar business, I'm the pusher. So I think we really? can push each other. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's hear your side <laughs> of the story, Lee. I want to hear yours. <laughs> so we're, I mean, honestly, we, we push each other. We challenge each other every day. What about this? What about this? What about this? <clears throat> but I was... I, I was trying to get digital into the Dawson Academy for years going, look what I can do. Look what I can do. You got to come look at this. Look what we can do digitally. And when John finally saw it, John just jumped all over it and embraced it. And you know, we talk every day, every yeah. day about what could we, can we do this? Can we do this? Can you do this? I mean, it, it's just so much fun to be building these types of workflows together. Okay. Well, now I, I got to ask this quick. Can I ask this question? We're going, I'm yeah. a dentist. I want to work with you, Lee. I'm not digital yet. Would you even consider me as a as a client or not? Or I mean, are you are we going to work together and you're going to lead me down that path? <laughs> Option three. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't even know. Option what that three. Means. So yeah, I'm not going to not work with you, but I'm going to encourage you over okay. and over and over. Uh, by showing you what I'm doing with other doctors and trying to embarrass you into going digital with me. Hey, you're good. You're good. <laughs> yeah, Lee has a great way of saying when I have a great idea about something, I'll, he'll say, oh, that's a good idea. And then there'll be a pause. Mm-hmm. Or... <laughs> Oh, wait, and then the or is usually a better. You know, he's got it. He's got a Paul Harvey. Here's the rest of the story thing coming. You know. Or we could do it this way. Okay, yeah, let's do it that way. Yeah. Because you've done it that way 57 times already. Yeah. Uh, but I do think I do think here here's what I do think I think so I think the pitfall for a young dentist is when they're looking at all these technologies it is overwhelming. Yeah. Because you're looking at scanners and and you're not really sure how it all fits together. Um, 
I actually think the young dentists get it better than like the 40 year old dentist. I think Why? Like, right? I just think like I watch my daughter. It's like when she came, I thought I was going to have to treat taught teacher analog, like the way I learned it. And then once she knew it analog, then I could teach her digital. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to get her to do the analog stuff. And then she's looking over my shoulder doing digital and it, all of a sudden I realized, and she said one day, she goes, you know, Dad, I understand it better with looking at what you're looking at than, than this stone thing in my hand. I mean, I yeah. can't hardly, I mean, I can hardly see the teeth. And I, so I think young Dennis, I think the big difference is they grew up with a freaking thing in their hand. I mean, they've yeah. had yep. a screen their whole life. So they're so accustomed. Same thing with my son who does our lab work. I mean, he learned how to mount in the stone and I was so worried he'd have struggles in the digital realm and he flies through the screen. So he's been playing video games his whole life. It's a video yep. game to him. Totally. So so I think at forty, around forty, do you agree, Lee? It seems like after that it you know, for some docs it can be a little bit of a struggle. You know, almost like a good analogy is if you learn a language before you're the age of five, you never you never learn have to learn to th- to translate in your mind. You just learn the language. Right. And I, so I think when you're 40, you have to be thinking, looking, learn, looking at the digital, but thinking back to the analog, to what it means. And I think younger people just, they just, they Get just it. assimilate to it. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. So now, um, so many questions that I have with this. Okay. So go back to what you said. Now, I totally agree with you that the younger dentist might pick it up, but like, help me make sense of it too, because everybody wants to sell me everything, John, you know, I go to the floor and it's like, buy everything right now. And I already have a lot of debt. So what, if you were going to build a skeleton, like a frame, so Let's let's start with the basics and then work our way out. Because I think you guys would both agree, you don't need everything right away. Let's nope. start no, no. with the, let's no, start with the skeleton don't. and work our way out. Where am I starting? I think you start with a scanner. I mean, I okay. think a good scanning system, and there's several good ones on the market. You know, if you're going to be doing a lot of ortho, you know, the Itero is a great scanner. If you're doing a lot more pros, the Trios is great. Whitmix has a new one on the market. I mean, there's a lot of good scanners. And right. and what I would just say is, you know, have the care stream, the tr- have them all come to your practice. They'd love to, to let you play with it and find the one that feels good. Talk to your laboratory about the, 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 the scans that they like. Um, mm-hmm. But we got tons and tons of, of options. And then the next thing is that I think, and the way I built it is I then went and looked at software that I could do something with it. So if I'm doing restorative and things like that, having software like three shapes where you can mount models and start doing some planning, then obviously printers and things are things that we're adding now so we can make our own, you know, print our wax steps, print our bite splints and things like that. But I agree with you hundred percent, Kirk. I I think the first thing is you get a, you get a scanner, you learn how to scan for simple, simple crowns. My concern is a lot of doctors stop there. It's like the scanner becomes only for simple things where they can be doing diagnostics and interfacing with labs and, and, and utilizing it at a much higher level. To me, this the, is- the mess, the, to me, the message is, and Lee touched on this, is um, digital provides us the ability to visualize three-dimensionally for simple and complex things so much better and easier than ever before. And so what I'm most excited about it is the ability for doctors to really embrace comprehensive care and maybe a way that they've avoided. And, And I still think there's a lot of dentists that kind of fly by the seat of their pants that just start just prepping cases and they don't really know where they're going. And right. there's just no reason to do that. Anymore. Yeah. Now this but is so fun because I've got Lee on the other side of it too. So comment on that. Well, I mean, this is what people don't know and don't realize. So dentists know scanners, they know CTs, even laboratories 
nobody really knows the power of the software. So we push the software, we make it do things it wasn't designed to do, and it's easy, it's fun, but people really don't know what kind of diagnostic work you can do. It's what we talked about in the beginning, Kurt. They, they think digital industry is to make something. You know, if I got this, then either I'm going to make something or somebody else is going to make something. But the software available today is very easy, very intuitive, very fun to use, and it's great for diagnostic diagnostics, for just looking at models on an articulator, for just evaluating while the patient's in the chair. And I don't, the world of digital doesn't even really know this or comprehend that you can do these things. So I think that's our message today. The, the software, the systems are so much more powerful to do all kinds of things that you didn't even know they were capable of. And John and I want to bring that to the world and show people how much better it can be doing what you're doing and doing a whole lot more doing it digital. Okay, so piggyback on that. So give me an example how you guys work together and one of the things that you teach. Like just an everyday process, John does this, I do that. Can, can you illustrate that? Yeah, so sure, let's talk John. about it. Uh, so, can I start and then I'll throw it yeah. to you? So no, let's, go, say, go. let's say something like digital dentures. Okay. Right, like something that you wouldn't, like I am fairly new to it, something that Lee kind of pushed me on maybe four or five months ago and I fully embraced. But like in a workflow before, if you think about a patient coming in with a crummy denture, you would kill yourself to get some decent impressions and then you'd make, you know, record bases and wax rims that would come back and you'd stick this wax in the mouth and mark a midline and try to get a bite and try to get the vertical and then you do 37 try-ins and you know and then you put something in the mouth that you hoped fit i mean I, i'm painting a bad picture but there dentures is an example in the analog world that it's quite amazing that we can make anything that ever somebody can tolerate and actually function pretty well with when we think about what we can do now so now in the digital world what i can do is if the patient comes in with a crummy set of dentures, what I can do is I can look at it, I might add to the borders with some rope wax or something, and then I'll reline it with a soft line. And then I take the dentures out of their mouth and I scan them in my hands, both sides. Then I put the dentures back in the mouth and then I scan the bite. And then we take a full series of photographs of that in the mouth so we know exactly where the teeth are. Yeah. And then I send it to Lee. And then Lee, what do you do? So we've got that information. Uh, we're 80% in the ballpark. So John has maybe made some marks on the existing denture that come in with the scans and I can look at it. So I'm gonna take that information digitally and I'm gonna bring it into my denture software and start creating new dentures based on the existing dentures. It's one of the easiest things to do, but by working together and taking some of that existing information, it makes my job very, very easy. And it makes that first try-in incredibly predictable. I mean, we, we're, we're gonna be either there or within 80% on that first try because we're registering back to something that was already good and John's giving me uh, the, the information digitally. He didn't have to send me dentures. He scanned the dentures, I get the dentures and we go from there. Yeah, I can't even it's, imagine too, you can probably see the bone levels, you can see everything that you probably sure. couldn't see before. Well, and the thing the thing that I like about it too is that it feels so much more like a restorative workflow. Like if I'm doing a full mouth rehab, I'll have scans of the teeth in there and we'll do a diagnostic wax up and I can see where the teeth were and I can add and scale the teeth and based on photographs, make these decisions. Well, Lee's doing the exact same thing. We'll do a team viewer meeting. We'll look at it together. We'll mm -hmm. decide on where the incisal ledge should go. And once that's locked in, then he prints a set of dentures for the try-in that we can put in. And like he said, you know, at that point, if the fit is good and the incisal edge is good, um, then it's just a go. The patient could even leave with that try-in if they wanted to, because he's going to mill the finals. All right. Give me some perspective on that. What's the ter time, time turnaround on that? Like, what, what are we talking? Like, how much time does that all take? So my go, end, is, uh, but I'll just ahead, say my, ahead. I'll just, let me do my part and then your part. So my part of scanning the dentures and taking a bite 
and the patient's probably there 35, 40 minutes, you know, and then they're gone. And there's, and the, you know, there's not alginate on the wall and, you know, <laughs> in their hair. I mean, it's so right. clean. Yeah. And so then it just goes to him and then lead. What do you, what do you say? Well, since we don't, we're not dealing with any physical three-dimensional objects, it's all virtual. It goes right into the software and we can design a denture in about the same time, 30 to 40 minutes. Wow. More then, predictable, more accurate than can ever be done by hand. Yeah. So the and, and, oh, go ahead. and just so you know, now my I have the same basic software that he does, and I'm learning to do some of the diagnostic stuff in house. And that's the other thing that is kind of interesting yes. right now is that dental offices really have the capacity if they have the printer to print some of these diagnostic things. Like we're printing all our our diagnostic wax ups and doing a lot of this in house. Um, and that's really exciting because, you know, you look, you look a hundred years ago or not hundred years, 50 years ago, people like Pete Dawson had their own master technician in their practice. And it kind of went away because there's so many materials, but, but more and more, this digital thing is bringing the ability to create things in the dental practice. If, if that's what the doctor desires. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. I absolutely love it. I have so many questions about what you guys are up to. Now, you're obviously combined in this great venture, which we're going to be talking about education, but let's talk about the state of education in general. Like, what do you think is, what's missing from dental education? What's the essence that's missing? I think, I think the biggest thing right now for me, and this could be a, you know, a whole podcast, but, but I do right. think, I do think that COVID changed a lot of things. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is um, the desire for a doctor to think that they have to go uh, two and a half, you know, across the country to sit in a hotel room for two and a half days like we all did to learn something. I think we all learned that, you know, lecture information and content can be gleaned in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think I think the conundrum right now is we're still trying to figure out exactly where that is. Um, there's definitely going to be a big surge in more and more information that's available online and in coaching formats and things that are maybe one-on-one -on -one and a little smaller. Um, and then the second thing is it puts a higher valuation or higher value, I think, on, on creating communities where people are learning together. So there may be a blend of a community that is in this format or on an app like WhatsApp or, and then periodic things where you bring the tribe together. I mean, that's what you've been so good at over the years, Kirk, is kind of combining these different, these different things. Um, but for the young doc, I think one of the biggest challenges is figuring out like, where do you want to go? Like, what do you, cause you can spend all your time running all over and it can be too much. So I think you have to really focus on what it is you want to become and look for the best sources that you feel comfortable. That's going to be in line with your values. I love it. Lee, what would you, what would be your answer to what's missing in dental education? So if we're, if we're talking post-grad now and not, uh, not university-based, it's the same thing. So there's a lot of phenomenal educators out there, but I still haven't seen anybody doing full-blown courses, education, diagnostics, and everything based on a digital format. I mean, there's, it's, it's kind of what John was talking about earlier. You know, you've, you've got this, this elephant of education and to try and change it. So it's the same in the universities to try and change everything to digital, to take an existing educational format and try to change it into digital. That's tough. That is tough. But if you live it every day and to create education based on digital, because that's what you do and you create it from the ground up, then that's what John and I are trying to do. Yeah, I love it. Now, I, I want you guys to talk about, but I got to ask you a couple questions first. And I'm just going to go there because you're freaking me out a little bit because I'm 51. <laughs> and you know how this stuff always kind of, you know, my mom always reminds me, you know, you just got to breathe in. She, she calms me a lot. She's like, breathe. you got to remember, my mom thought Elvis was the devil. So like everything <laughs> that's coming that's new, we don't like it at first. Sure. Cause it's so different. And then you, you know, once it takes mainstream, if you're an early doctor and you go, this is, and it's, 
it's made its proof of concept, you know, this is the way to go. So let me ask mm -hmm. you this, you know, was it two years ago that the first robot placed an implant, you know, or was it three years ago? You guys all saw that post. You're like, oh gosh, now here's what dentists do. It's over. It's over. Just like when fluoride came in, it's over, you know, like, so let me ask you the question, how much of the digital is going to take away from the technician or the actual dental side of things from your perspective? So I'll jump in first, just because you referred to something. So the company Neosis and Yomi are the company you're talking about. So they just contracted with me to expand their restorative and surgical format that they're doing. Wow. So, I mean, I've, I've been going to Yomi surgeries and it's one of the most incredible things you've ever seen. So do I think robotics and AI and more and more things are going to come into dentistry? Absolutely. Nobody's going to want to hear this. It's not ever going to happen. You got to have a dentist in the room. You got to have a technician making things. I don't don't know. I just don't know. Not with some of the things we're seeing out there. But that robotic surgery blew my mind, just absolutely blew my mind. And it's going to expand. I mean, the questions are already, well, can we can the robot prep teeth? Can the robot do this? Can the robot do this? Not today. But every time somebody says it can't be done, it's usually done. So are these things going to come? I don't think there's any question. It may not be in the next 10 years, but are they going to come? Absolutely, Kurt. No question about it. Yeah. yeah John, what I, are and I, I agree with them. I mean, I, I remember hearing Galip Garel um, at a cosmetic meeting that we were both on, and I was talking about cone beam and guided surgery kind of before people were really talking about this is 10 or more years ago. And he showed this prototype for a little machine that he visualized. Now you think about this, it was like a little tooth scanner, but it would kind of, it would kind of clamp onto the molars. And then there was a little camera that would kind of roll across the front teeth. And basically what he was showing is that you would import a wax up into this thing of where you want to go. And then this thing would clamp on the teeth and it would then scan the surfaces of the teeth. And then the hand piece would come in and prep it precisely to the thickness for whatever thickness veneer you want based on that. Now, of course, it was all prototypical at the time, but everybody in the room was flipping out. I don't think there's any question that that could happen. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. the, 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 thing, the thing that we have to remember, though, is that, w that there's always, for people that are on the cutting edge, and there's always a need for people to do things, right? right? There's, and so I don't think our job's going to go away, but it may be significantly different. My job is considerably different than it was four years ago sure. from embracing these technologies. I mean, today I had a gal show up that hadn't been in the office for a while. Um, she had five implants integrating and, and anyway, lost husband, all these things started what happened. She showed up and wants to get moving, you know, to kind of get things restored. And, you know, I was able to take her scans and by lunch I had about an hour open and I did the complete wax up and printed the model by the end of the day. Well, I'm ready to go on Friday to kind of take her to her next level. And I think about the old way, you know, my, the models would be basically setting in the laboratory right now. I mean, I wouldn't have been close to be able to do that. So I think the thing that I think Lee and I both love about this right now, I mean, we're both 60. We've both been doing this a long time. Um, it's one of the most rewarding things of dentistry is to remember that we always have the opportunity to, to change and evolve and get better. Yeah. And I'm honestly having more fun in dentistry maybe than I've ever had, partly because I visualized this 15 or 16 years ago. I could see where this was going. Right. And when I think about AI and robotics, it's really just the next level pass with what we're doing right now. That's sure. what I look at. Yeah, and that's one of my questions. So talk about this. So we talked about robotics a little bit. Go more specifically in the AI thing. Like you guys are privy to some pretty cool stuff that mm -hmm. nobody else sees. Where do you think AI, and it's anyone's guess, what's AI look like a year or two years from now? Just from that perspective. 
So, I mean, we're, we're seeing it a lot in education, starting to see prototypical ways to use AI where we're like you're wearing an Oculus handpiece and working on a patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, just working on virtual patients in a virtual laboratory, in a virtual clinical setting, just like you would do anything else. So we're already in the meta, in the metaverse, in the metaverse. (laughs) But also if we look at what we do in dentistry, I mean, we've got so many patients and so many, so many different ways they present to us and things like that. But if we could, if we could restore everybody back to the ultimate perfection or biological perfection for what it was, there's a lot of anatomical landmarks. There's a lot of geometry. There's a lot of math in what we do. So just in dentures, just talk, just take dentures. So we've got a full open corridor to do literally anything we want. A lot of dentures is based on math, anatomical landmarks, and geometry. I think one of the first things we're going to see is full AI for doing dentures. And just Mm -hmm. push a button. It looks. It measures. There's so much math involved in doing a denture. I just think we're going to see that go pretty quickly. And then as other things come in, we'll see AI starting to take over those designs also. Wow. I think it's it's the same with, like, you know, with what we're doing and with diagnostic waxing, you know, we can uh, bring in the scan and, you know, we're not waxing, we're actually choosing a mold and then scaling the tooth. So all that anatomy that Lee Culp did or Matt Roberts did, I mean, all that's maintained. So I'm doing the best, I'm doing the most beautiful wax ups of my life, but I'm really just scaling teeth. Well, it's not hard to imagine that if you had the data in the computer, which had the virtual, the, the scans, the virtual articulator, and some facial photos, that there's just no way that it's that, that it's not going to come to pass that that the computer is going to scan that face and make a proposal yep. based on three or four pictures or maybe a face scan of of where these teeth should be and what mold would be, be- better best for the face. Now we may be able to change things a little bit, but we're going to be so much closer than where we are now. I mean, that that's happening. Um, yep. I know three shapes and you probably can comment on this, this Lee, but you know, three shapes just for basic single tooth crowns has a, uh, an AI, uh, package that labs can get where the scan goes there. And like two minutes later, the design comes back, you know, the wow. computers marking the margins and creating the restoration. And, uh, do you want to comment on that Lee? I mean, that's an existence now. Yeah, and it's I mean it's funny, John, and we tend to overlook this, but when I when I when I hear things like that, <clears throat> so Sarek had had that 18 years ago. I, you know, of looking at the surrounding teeth, you know, and proposing where the tooth went. I was I also worked for the company E4D, which is uh, Plan Mecca now. I was the vice president of, of dental there. And we br- actually brought Pete Dawson in to teach the engineers what to look for in occlusion so they could start to develop they, their AI. Now back then we didn't we didn't call it AI. We just we didn't really even have a name for it. It was morphing in, in existing teeth, but the computers from Sarek to uh, uh, Plan Mecca today look at the occlusion, they look at the contacts, they look at the margin, they propose something, and we we don't even touch it. So it's been around for actually a long, long time. We just kind of forget that Sarek's been doing it that for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So I have so many other questions I want to ask you guys, but, uh, you know, in the sake of time, this could be a three hour show because I want to go down every component. I want you guys to talk about what you're up to. You guys are creating something very cool and very special. And you're not telling me the whole story. Like you're hiding it behind. Like, can you pull back the curtains from, Oz, yeah. you know, and just tell so, us what you're up to? Yeah. So I think what we're really after is creating a community of, um, of first quality oriented dentists and it's that care about occlusion care about aesthetics care about biologic health <clears throat> but have the passion of doing this inside of a digital framework and so um uh, cranham cult digital dental uh has a a online presence where 
people that have the three shape premiere software, they kind of got to think of that as like the virtual articulator, the, the ability to do virtual diagnostic waxing. Um, if they have a scanner and get involved with that, then we can teach them how to use it. We can teach them how to work do to do the workflows and determine whether the workflows are going to happen in their office or maybe they're going to do the first part of the analysis and the lab finishes it so we're bringing labs together and doctors together um we stay connected uh through a, a a private chat group so questions can get answered immediately and then we've got some online or some uh, in-person uh training as well that really allow people we call it digital immersion but they can come in for two days and really and really train with us. So, um, so it's a lot of fun. And uh, yep. it, you know, last year I I kind of did a proof of concept with twenty five docs, uh, mm -hmm. kind of doing this program and coaching, and it was very successful. And and I it occurred to me that I needed Lee uh, just just for his expertise and the lab side of it. And so we launched the first of the year, and uh, and that's what we're doing. So it's great. Very cool. So if I'm a dentist listening, how the heck do I find out about this? And you guys have a course coming up, right? We're hosting a course for you guys, and you're going to see the link to that. But you're also doing you're doing some other stuff too, right? So what's the website? So the website is cc, Cranham Culp, Digital Dentistry com. It'll go live by the end of next week. So we were kind of timing it for this uh, cast, Kirk. So you were kind of our, <clears throat> this is where we're starting right here, the big announcement and everything else. But uh, it'll go live and we're going to keep feeding online content uh, because we just feel that's important and create the community. But when we were looking at this, John and I were doing the same thing. I mean, if you look at the education that's offered digitally and there's a technique and here's how to here's how to make something and here's how to make something and here's how to make something. There's a lot of really great education on how to make something. There's not a really good lot of there's not a good amount of education on really how to look at the patient and how to use digital dentistry to to serve a patient, to diagnose, how to treatment plan, all the options and the efficiency and the speed at which you can report that back. I mean, one of the things John can do, we were talking about it earlier, he would have taken an impression, made a model, mail it to me. It's going to come to me. It's going to sit for a couple of days. I'm going to throw some wax on it. I'm going to mail it back. It may be two weeks before he even knows what's possible and the patient could have lost interest. John right now can do that. He can do that in less than 30 minutes while the patient's sitting in the chair. Yeah. I mean, or, that, that is so powerful. Days, I mean. And it's not, it's not a two-dimensional picture that you just slap some white teeth on. This is their mouth three-dimensionally, and John has evaluated what can actually be done very, very quickly. Very cool. Yeah. In centric relation, you know, the, the yep. taking all the things that we did, you know, that we spent years learning, but doing it in a virtual world. And, and so that's right. what we're doing, you know, and, and I think that the other thing that we want to do is with this community is it becomes Lee and I's job to keep people a hundred percent up to date on the things that are changing because it's changing right. very, very rapidly. And, uh, and that's really fun to do. Yeah. I love it. I mean, you're combining a lot of the things that I love about what you do, obviously the technical excellence, but you said at the beginning communication, like, I've said, we've yeah. said this so many, your ability to communicate is going to determine how far you go in dentistry. So these tools are yeah. awesome, but you got to learn how to use them, communicate and create value for people. And that's really where it all comes together. So I'm excited to see what you guys do. Heck, I'm, yeah. you're, you're messing with my brain already. So like this, you're just, you know, giving me some nuggets here. So this is going to yeah, be fun. Give a, you can give us a follow on Instagram too, John C. Cranham DDS. And then uh, was it Cranham Cult Digital Dental? We've got a, we got an Instagram on that too. So yes. We'll be posting stuff up there too. Yeah. So our guys, uh, the, uh, our post-production team will put all these in the show notes. So if you're driving, don't look at it while you're driving. You can flip on, on Stitcher, iTunes, whatever. It's going to be links to everything that they've shared today. Make sure you check it out. Follow them on Instagram. I'm going to vow and told you guys to come back. And we're just going to put a whole another layer on the education here. Because, again, I want people to take nuggets right. of this and apply it in their own lives. So Yeah, that's the goal. This was the entry. And what we're going to do from here on out is take a topic like digital dentures or implants or aesthetics and really drill down on these workflows 
and uh, maybe even have a little some slides for those people that are that are watching too. So. I got an idea. What if we have people submit their toughest stuff and go try that one, buddy? I love it. <laughs> that'd, that'd be great. That would be. That great. actually might be. be. There's not going to be anything that people send that Lee has not seen. Trust me. You know what's that? What's that game show where you got like Simon Cowell all up there, and you get everybody trying all? I mean, we do it in oh, a collaborative, yeah. positive sense, but people could throw their sure. toughest stuff at you, and John, you could go, "Whoa, this one, ooh, this is tough." I uh, just say, Lee. I just say, Lee. What do you think? There you go. There you go. <laughs> now you're exposing my secret. And if you guys are listening, you know, surround yourself with great people. <laughs> yeah. They can yeah. figure stuff out in a way that you can't figure it out. So that's why I like hanging around with you guys. I feel smarter just hanging out. So, hey, thank you guys for being on. Um, stick around. Absolutely. Yeah. So stick around. Make sure you guys check out what they're doing. And again, we'll have links down there. Uh, so keep sending us suggestions. I get suggestions from you guys all the time on things you guys want to see. I will put these guys on, and we'll ask them the tough stuff. What do you think? I think it's a good idea. Cool. So, no, yeah. Great idea. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, hey, uh, if you guys enjoyed today, just do us a favor, hit the share button, share with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions, like I said. And then um, if you enjoyed today, do us a favor, just hit the review button, the four or five-star review, because you know what we get to do? We get to find other people like you, which is my favorite thing. Keep showing up with us. We're going to make your life and your practice a little bit better each time. And until we see you guys next time, keep watching or listening to the Best Practices Show. You guys, enjoy your day. Thank you.